For those of you that have been with us over the last year, you know that we've been in this series called Storyline. And basically in a year's time, we've been trying to get through the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation and trying to see the storyline of God throughout human history. So from Adam and Eve all the way to the church age into today, like how has Jesus been been woven even throughout the Old Testament into the New? And um, it's been awesome for us to dig in and do that. For, for those of you, again, who haven't been with us, we have a journal out at the table in the foyer that says Storyline on it. And it basically is just an opportunity for you to read along with us week by week. We, we've, um, put our, we publish our readings for the week on the website. And so you can be in their daily readings with us. You can be journaling just what it is you're learning. Some of you have not done any of that. And it's totally cool because we're hitting reset because now we're starting the book of Luke this morning and we're in the New Testament. And so you can start over again. And so if you want to grab one of those books uh, this morning as you're on your way out, grab one. And I just encourage you to start where we're, um, where we're picking up this morning in the book of Luke. But I'm excited to get into this transition from the Old Testament to the New. The Old Testament, how many of you guys have learned something from the Old Testament in the last year? Like, it's been pretty cool to see how intricately, intricately Jesus is connected in the Old Testament. But there's something really neat about the New Testament and now watching Jesus come to earth and live this life and, and then essentially like die a brutal death and be resurrected and then send his Holy Spirit and then watch the church explode um, in the book of Acts. And so for the next 12 weeks about, we're going to be four weeks in the book of Luke, then we're going to be four weeks um, in the book of Acts, and then we're going to be four or five weeks in the book of Revelation, and then we'll be done with the series. So we're going to go hard for the next three months and then be finished. So I'd encourage you to grab one of those books and follow along with us um, so that you can kind of be learning along the way and not just trying to grab what you can on Sundays because we're really shooting from a fire hose. This, this week, you guys will be reading Luke 1 through 6, and so I'm going to try my best to give you some good context and then uh, talk a little bit out of Luke chapter 3, but then this week, you guys get to dig in and read that for yourself. Um, I know that uh, naturally, you'd probably think we would dive in and kind of camp out at the story of Christ's birth this week just because of the season we're in, but we're actually going to save that for a few weeks from now when we actually get together on Christmas Eve. And so this morning, we're going to primarily just talk about John the Baptist, uh, this forerunner for Jesus. And so if you guys, again, turn with me to Luke chapter 3, and then um, if you guys would just bow your heads with me, let's pray and ask Jesus to do something awesome here today. You guys, you're alive, right? Check your pulse, like reach over and feel the pulse of the person next to you, make sure they're with us this morning. Um, we aren't the frozen chosen, right? This is the church that Jesus bled and died for. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your church. We thank you for uh, just the awesome work that you're doing, God. And this morning, I just, I realized, Lord, that there is no power in what I have to say or the words I have to read. God, all the power comes through your spirit. And so I pray as we talk this morning, God, that anything you desire for those that are here this morning to take with them, God, that you would do the heavy lifting of taking what it is that's said and what it is that's read and planting it in our hearts. And so I pray this morning that you'd open our hearts up to receive from you. There are people in this room, God, who have just come here. Uh, maybe th this morning they've literally decided they do not care what is said. And, and Lord, I pray that you'd soften their hearts and you'd speak something to them this morning. Maybe there are those here that just assume, I already know it and I've been around it forever. God, would you do something to break through our hearts this morning and bring us to a very humble place where we're willing to acknowledge you and realize that um, if not by your power, God, then we don't have a leg to stand on. And so, Jesus, we give this time to you, and we pray that you are rightfully honored and worshiped during our time together in your name. Amen. All right, you guys ready? Sweet, thanks. Um, so again, we're starting the book of Luke this morning. Uh, Luke is known, the book of Luke, I want to give you some context so you know where we're at and kind of how we get up to this point. Because without that, um, it, a lot doesn't make sense. But there's so many cool things that have happened at the close of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament. So Luke is one of the books that we refer to as the Gospels. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospel accounts of Christ's birth, his, his life, um, his death, his resurrection. And again, we refer to these as the gospel accounts. Uh, what we know of Jesus' life 
um, on earth primarily comes from these four accounts. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These men were men that were led by the Holy Spirit to pen these words that we read and to give an account for Christ's life um, so that we would actually know the truth of who Jesus was and what Jesus did. I mean, we know about Jesus because of what the Holy Spirit has led these four men to write in their accounts of Christ's life. So uh, of the four gospel writings, two were written by disciples of Jesus. Uh, We have Matthew and John. And then two were actually written by men who became followers of Christ later on, which is Luke and Mark. And Luke is, again, who we'll be talking through this morning. Of these four, Luke was actually this faithful follower of the Apostle Paul. And even though Paul didn't accompany Jesus, Paul didn't walk with Christ, um, Paul did have an encounter with Jesus, like a very real direct revelation from Christ. And so Paul did engage Jesus in a very real way. And Luke is learning from Paul, essentially. And so Luke is this interesting person that was chosen to write one of the gospel accounts of Jesus's life because Luke was actually a physician and Luke was a Gentile. So, uh, in fact, he's the only Gentile or non-Jewish author of the New Testament. He's the only one that doesn't have that, that Jewish background. He grew up as a Gentile, and he was a doctor. And so Luke's account of, of Christ's life um, was written actually after Jesus had died and, and, and rose again. And so Luke comes back, and then he starts to give an account for Christ's life to kind of pen it and have it um, be in this Bible for us to read from today. Again, Luke was a a physician, and interestingly enough, the Jews didn't like dealing with bodies. They didn't like dealing with sickness and death. In fact, that meant uncleanliness to them, and so they couldn't touch dead bodies or the sick. And so what ended up happening was the physicians were actually Gentiles. They were non-Jewish people who could actually touch the sick and, 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 and work with uh, moving the dead and stuff, and the, 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 Jewish, the Jewish folks could not do that. And so Luke, again, he's the perfect guy to be a doctor because he's a Gentile, um, but he also his account of the gospel story of Jesus' life comes across a little bit different to us than any of the other accounts because of his background as a physician. Luke is way more scientific in the way that he thinks and the way that he writes. Anybody else in here think like scientifically? You see things in order, you like plans and uh, like spreadsheets, like Luke loved Excel, right? And uh, he was just making spreadsheets his whole life. But he liked to get things in order. He wanted to make sure that he had the facts straight. And so Luke's book is written uniquely because of his upbringing, because of his Gentile upbringing. Um, Luke, again, he loves specific details. For instance, one of the most remarkable things about Luke's accuracy was his familiarity with correct titles for people and of like the notable people that are mentioned in scripture. He gives an account of a lot of these people. And so you're able to actually go back in history and see where Luke mentions specific notable people at certain times. And you can make that connection in history and actually it brings it together. So you understand that the Bible is not just some fictitious story that we read from, but it actually is historically accurate. And so Luke paints this picture for us very, very clearly. Uh, If you read through the first four verses of the book of Luke, Luke gives us this glimpse into, uh, like, as to why um, he's credible in actually writing this account. He knew that there would be skeptics. He knew that there would be people that would doubt what it is they're reading, and he had to get it across in such a way that people would understand that what he was speaking was truth and that he did the due diligence in, in doing his research and studying and putting this together and doing it in chronological order so that the truth would be um, made known. And so he says in, uh, at the beginning of the, the book of Luke there in Luke chapter 1, Um, verses one through four. He says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us with Jesus, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. So he says, many have tried to compile accounts of the life of Jesus as they were handed down to them by these eyewitnesses and people that actually walked with Jesus. And so Luke thought he should take a shot at writing this himself, being that he was in a better position to write on this behalf than uh, many others because of two things. One, he says he investigated it very well, everything carefully. And two, because he wrote it all down chronologically in order. 
And he says that he did all of this so that the reader would know the exact truth of the things that are being taught. How many of you guys want to know the exact truth? Like, we want to know that what we read is not a story. Like, this is, li- this is serious. This is historically proven. And so Luke puts this together in such a way that we can link it with history and see that this is truth that he's speaking. And so that's our hope for all of us today, that, that we believe what it is we're taught and that we're ensured that we get the facts straight. And so knowing the facts actually strengthens our faith. And those who diminish the value of studying the Bible don't appreciate the Bible's relationship to faith, that we have to have faith to know the word. And so Romans ten seventeen says, so faith comes from hearing. And he says that hearing comes from the word of Christ. So the very foundation of our relationship with Jesus begins with his word, and our ability to actually hear it comes from the word, and our ability to grow in our faith comes from the word. Like without the word, we have nothing. Jesus said that he was the word, right? So, so the word is the centerpiece for everything that we believe as followers of Jesus, and Jesus himself was the word manifest before us. So one question you might ask um, in getting into the New Testament is how did we get here? Like if you're like me, you get into the New Testament and then when you end the old, you realize there's this massive gap. Like we end in the book of Malachi and then we pick up in Matthew. Like how did we get to this place and what happened in between these times? Because when you pick up the New Testament and you start reading it, it's a totally different world culturally than where it left off in the book of Malachi. And so to try to figure out, like, how does this pan out? Like, what the heck happened in that meantime, in that intertestamental period? So at the close of the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, the, the nation of Israel is back again in the land of Palestine after the Babylonian captivity. We talked about this, right? The, the Israelites go into captivity, they come back, they rebuild the temple, and, and it seems as though things are starting to um, kind of mellow out a little bit for the Israelites, maybe return to some sense of normalcy, even though they're actually ruled from the Persian Empire at this point. And so we end the book of Malachi, and then this gap of 400 years before we start the New Testament, something drastically changes because at the close of, again, of Malachi, um, they're under the, the, the um, domination of this world power, like the Persian Empire at this time. But when we pick up in the Old Testament, all of a sudden, the Roman Empire is in control. So what happened in this period of time? So it, it, what, what's interesting is you see that although they were a weak people, the Israelites, um, that, that they were actually united, that there was more camaraderie um, and unity at this time than had existed in the past when they get into the book of Malachi here, when the prophet's writing. But there weren't any political schisms, there weren't any factions among them, um, there weren't any, they weren't divided into groups and into parties, and then all of a sudden we hit the New Testament, we see the Roman Empire is in control, and now we all of a sudden have all these religious factions in place. So in this 400 year period, understand the Persians are in control at the end of Malachi there, and then it goes into re- Greek power, it goes to the Egyptians, it goes to the Syrians, and then we, the Romans take over. And so leading up to the New Testament, for about 60 years, the Romans have been in control. They've been developing this empire. And so when you open the New Testament in the book of Matthew, you discover an an entirely different atmosphere, almost a completely different world where Rome's now the dominant power of the earth. The Roman legions have spread throughout the length and the breadth of the civilized world at that time. And the center of power has shifted uh, from the east to the west now to Rome. And so Rome's in control. The the high priests who now sit in the seat of these, uh, being these religious authorities over the nation are no longer from the line of Aaron. They're no longer bringing them up from their priestly lineage. These are actually hired hands that are the priests now when we get into the New Testament. It's a totally different world. They, 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 again, they can't trace their descendancy back. Um, rather, they're just these hired hands to fulfill their priestly duties. The, the, the temple is still the center of Jewish worship, although the building itself has been partially destroyed and rebuilt about a half dozen times since the Old Testament. Testament ends. So there's a lot of change that's happening as we get into the New Testament. The, the synagogues have now sprung, sprung up in like every Jewish city that existed. There's Jewish synagogues everywhere. And at this time, the people of Israel were split into three major categories, three parties. Two of them, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which you read about a lot in the gospel accounts, which were the prominent ones. And then the third one was a smaller group called the Essenes. 
And if we read the book of Malachi and then pick up in Matthew, we see this vast difference in Jewish culture, though. The, these books give us this amazing like, insight into the spiritual and the philosophical and the intellectual life of Judaism in the period between Malachi, the 400 years between Malachi and the opening of the New Testament. What's crazy about this period, though, is that God goes completely silent for 400 years. For 400 years, God doesn't say a thing. And what have, what have the Jews been used to up to this point? God speaking through a prophet, like delivering this message to them, changing their course of action, trying to get them back on track. And then all of a sudden, the prophet Malachi speaks, and then God goes silent for 400 years. They don't hear from him. And so you can think what's happening behind the scenes. God's not directing them. They've, taught, they've sort of taken matters into their own hands at this point. And so they're being ruled by different forces, like different empires that are coming in and taking over this guy and taking over this guy. And then now you, it leads up to the Roman Empire taking over. And they've just been handed around for 400 years. God's been completely silent. But what you see in the people is this hunger starting to develop in them for the Messiah, which you didn't see prior. In fact, at the end of the book of Malachi there, Malachi's ticked and he's giving them this prophetic word because what they're doing is they're chasing after all these other idols. They're going after the pagan culture. They're becoming like the heathens at the time. And so they don't look like Jews anymore. They're becoming like the world. And so Malachi preaches this, this insane prophecy to them and basically tells them like they're doomed for destruction. And then all of a the sudden there's this brief prophecy at the end there that will tie into the New Testament, but God goes silent for 400 years, and they stop hearing from him. What's interesting in this time period as well is that as the Romans take over, the Romans start developing the nations, and so they start putting roads between all the cities and connecting everything, and they have all these transit systems in place and everything, and so how cool is it that even though God goes silent for 400 years, in the back end, God's actually working through what's being built on the earth. Because now that these roads are in place and they have transportation and all these things in place, the gospel can actually go forth way easier now in the Roman Empire than it could have before. It can be extended to the ends of the earth at that time. And so um, we come into the New Testament. Again, the Romans are, are in place. Um, like God, though the, the Jews think that God's been silent or he's been silent for 400 years, God's been working in the back end, doing this internal work in them. Because what they're doing is getting dissatisfied with the state of things. Their hearts are actually being tilled. God is working inside them to prepare them for this Messiah. Honestly, church, we live in a day and age today where I hope that is happening within us. I think as we get further along down the road and closer to Christ's return, that you're going to start to see people's hearts being stirred, that they're going to see a need for a Messiah. They're going to know that they need something else, that everything they've been reaching and latching onto and trying to take control of themselves just isn't working, and it just leaves them kind of wrung out and spit out. And then at some point, they need to realize that they were created for one purpose, to serve the Almighty God. But the Jews couldn't acknowledge it. At the end of the Old Testament there, before God goes silent, they'd taken things into their own hand and assumed that because their religion was so solid, they were such religious people, that they were good to go. And so God removes himself from the people. And in the back end, what's happening is they're growing more and more dissatisfied with the state of things. And how cool is it that what we see happen in the New Testament is the birth of Jesus when the Messiah comes to earth at the perfect time in history when people's hearts have been being prepared for this for 400 years. This is awesome. And so this isn't just like God randomly decided to drop Jesus onto the earth at this, uh, you know, some some uh, like random point in time. It was very specific. God has been piecing this together over time so the Messiah would come at just the right time when people are ready for it. So um, we open in the book of Luke with this really short story of two, or two short stories of two births. Um, remember that the, the last thing that the <coughs> prophet Malachi said in Malachi chapter four, if you guys want to turn there, you can. <clears throat> but before we make the connection, Malachi chapter 4, the very last two verses in Malachi, say, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. goes on to say, He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children 
and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Like, he will rescue, he will save, he will unite. Like, there's something that God is going to do. And then we fast forward, Malachi ends here, and God's gone silent for 400 years. And now look in Luke chapter 1 at verse 17. We, we have this, we have at this point this, uh, this priest, Zacharias, who's in the temple praying, and the angel Gabriel shows up to him, and the angel Gabriel says that um, he's going to have a son. Zacharias' wife, Elizabeth, has been barren, and she's old, and there's no way she can have a kid. And this angel shows up and says, your wife is actually going to give birth to a son. He says, many are going to rejoice in his birth, and he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. How many of you guys want a kid like that, right? Many are going to rejoice in his birth, and this person's going to be great in the eyes of the Lord. It says, he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in Elizabeth's womb. So even at the point that he's in the womb, the Holy Spirit has already filled this boy. And so there's this promise that comes to um, Zacharias here. Now understand, there's been 400 years. They have not heard from God at all. It's been silent, and Zacharias is a priest, and he's standing in the temple, and the first sign that God has come back and he's now vocalized himself again is at this point when the angel Gabriel shows up to Zacharias and says, you're gonna have a son, and he's gonna be great in the eyes of the Lord. Now, we don't have any concept of what this would be like because honestly, we live in a day and age where the Holy Spirit, we have access to the Holy Spirit always. You guys have access to Jesus always, 24-7. But imagine a period of time where God was distant. He was quiet. You were used to hearing from him, used to being guided by him, and now all of a sudden God is gone. So imagine what this was like for Zacharias to just think it was going to be business as usual and God's not really talking and I'm just going to go do my priestly duties and boom, an angel shows up in your midst and says, your wife's going to give birth to a son. Your son's going to be great in the eyes of the Lord. He goes on to say, read in verse 16 and 17, And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to their God. Now listen to this. Remember that that passage in Malachi 4. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of who? Elijah. Then it says, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for who? The Lord. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this word comes to, to Zacharias, and what the angel says is exactly what was prophesied at the end of the book of Malachi. It's been 400 years, so Zacharias has to be standing there going, are you kidding me? Like, he's literally repeating exactly what the prophet Malachi shared 400 years ago before God went silent. Like, this has to be the Lord. You can see how God is in this. He's moving and preparing people's hearts. And so it's been 400 years. Now this angel shows up. Tell Zacharias him and his wife are going to have a kid. <clears throat> and then after this, there's a story of another mom, Mary. And, and, and so Mary, the angel Gabriel shows up to Mary. Once again, Mary's Elizabeth's cousin. And Mary's visited by the same angel. And, she, and the angel tells Mary that she would also conceive a child. But she'd actually conceive a child as a virgin. Like it, just this miraculous conception and that she should name her son Jesus, that he would be the son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David, that he will reign forever and his kingdom have no end. And then the angel tells her that this would be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit that would actually come upon Mary. And so Mary is also told, again, that her cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant, and that she's had this miraculous conception too, obviously not a virgin, um, but with her husband, Zacharias, and she'd been barren for years and old, and all of a sudden she's going to be pregnant. And so they're having these two miraculous kids. And so now being that we're going to spend a lot of time in, on Jesus in a few weeks, um, I want to just highlight kind of the purpose of John the Baptist. And I want to camp out in Luke chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 1 there. Are you guys with me? You good? You got all that? Okay. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Etyria, and Trachonitis and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, 
In where? The wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of, uh, of the words of Isaiah the prophet, so if you go back in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, this is pulled directly from there. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of our God. So 700 years prior to uh, John the Baptist's arrival, the prophet Isaiah was sharing this word about God's master plan uh, like in action as God selected John to be this special ambassador to proclaim his own coming. But John lived a really odd life. Like he preached a super harsh message. I mean, listen to that. His message was he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Anybody else want to share that message around a table with a bunch of your friends? Like, that's a harsh message. But John the Baptist, again, he lived this somewhat strange life. Someone once said that uh, he was like an under-socialized relative who shows up unannounced and unexpected at holidays and other social functions and embarrasses everybody. Any of you guys have those relatives? This is not the dude you want to invite to Thanksgiving dinner, right? Um, John lived in the desert as a Nazarene, meaning he had taken this vow to consecrate his life before the Lord. He was one of two people that didn't have a choice in taking this vow. In fact, it was told his mom, uh, uh, it, it was told his dad uh, from before he was conceived that he would take on this vow, that he would go without wine, that he would be consecrated before the Lord. And so, um, so it says that John ate locusts and wild honey. That sounds yummy, right? That it indicates that he lived in seclusion in the wilderness and that nobody brought him any food, so he had to fend for himself. He had to survive on whatever he could find in the desert. It says that he wrapped himself with a garment made from camel's hair, which he probably made himself from a dead camel that he must have found in the desert. Like, do you think this is the dude you want to invite home for dinner? The dude that smells like camel and, uh, and eats locusts and wild honey and actually enjoys his life. Like, that's just, and he's telling you to repent and be baptized, you know? Like, uh, this guy's just a crazy dude. But he lives this insanely simple life. He, he didn't have a home. He didn't have any possessions. He, he didn't have any other change of clothes except for the one that he was covered with. And behind all this, John had this really significant purpose. There was a method to the madness. Like all this was for one purpose. And the purpose was what? To prepare the way of the Lord that John would come before the Messiah and actually be involved in intricately stirring up the hearts and preparing people for what was to come. I mean, this guy, what I love most about John is that John was just not about himself. It wasn't about John. Nothing he did was about him. He was actually like this stepping stone so everybody could walk on him to get to Jesus. And it's this amazing picture of really what you and I are called to be, these people that are like stepping stones for the world to walk on to engage Christ in a real way. Like in, in the same way that John is preparing the way for the Lord as this Messiah is coming and he's kind of introducing them and, and, and getting their hearts ready to receive him, you, the church, actually, actually have this call on your life to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. Like, as Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, it is our, like, privilege to be the ones to go out and prepare people's hearts for the Messiah that's coming again. And this was John's life. Again, he lived this, this menial life. Like, he didn't have anything, but everything he did was just preparing people for Jesus' arrival. Um, his early childhood was probably not different than um, Jesus's. And it says in verse 2 that the word of the Lord came to him in the wilderness. And after receiving that word, John goes into all the districts around Jordan preaching this baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sin. So um, though today I think the word baptism, um, we have one kind of uh, view of the, the word baptism. Like it, it, Normally when I say baptism, it, it evokes in you these thoughts of identifying with like Christ's death and his burial and resurrection because that's what we know baptism as. But baptism actually didn't begin with Christians. And so for years before Jesus, the Jews had used baptisms as this ritual cleansing ceremony for the Gentile proselytes. And so John the Baptist 
took baptism and actually applied it to all the Jews as well. So you had all these Jews that are going, yeah, the Gentiles need to get cleansed because they're dirty people, and, and, but we have this lineage with Abraham, and so we're good to go. Like, we're straight, and so you need to preach this message to all the Gentiles. And what John was doing was actually saying, this message is all-inclusive. All of you need to come to a point in your life where you repent, you're forgiven of your sins, you're baptized by the Lord. And so John begins preaching this message to them, and their pride begins to flare up inside because in them, they're thinking like everything is good. We've got it together. Like we go to church, we do Bible studies, we do all the Christian things, and yet now you're telling us that we're not okay, that there's something more to the story, and John's basically going, yeah, you need to own this for yourself. You need to stop relying on others as being the source of your spiritual sustenance and start learning that Jesus, the Messiah that's to come, is the only one that can save you. And I wonder sometimes, like, this message that John preached, why it's so difficult for us to take this message to the world. Like, in the name of relevancy, we try to water everything down and make it this really easy message of, like, I don't want to talk about, um, I don't want to talk about uh, sin, and I don't want to talk about repentance and, and all of this stuff because that just sounds too harsh, and so we'll water it down, and I'm going to like relationally like love them for a while until we can get to the point to talk about these things. And John was just in their face, like, here it is. Like, you want to you wanna know the Messiah? Then this is what you're going to have to do. Humble yourselves, repent, be baptized, have your sins forgiven. And so that's, that's what John does with his life. And one of the questions that I was thinking while I was preparing for this is, is your life cluttered with things of this world so much, all of the time, that all of your time and your energy and all your resources are spent taking care of these things, and you have no time, no energy and resources left for the Lord? And yet John, we see, lived this life of nothing, solitude and simplicity, and made the Lord everything in his life. And where's the balance for you and I? Because we live in a world that doesn't allow us to live in the wilderness and eat locusts and wild honey and cover ourselves in camel hair. <laughs> we live in a world that's constantly coming at us, telling us to dress this way, say this, do that, have this job, make this much money, build this kingdom for yourself, buy that house, do this, yada, yada, yada. The list goes on and on and on. Like you live in a world that's constantly vying for your attention. What does it look like for us to live lives of solitude and simplicity? What does it look like for us in our day and age to actually make Jesus first and foremost in our lives and point others to him. Because the more caught up you are in your life, the less people see Jesus in you. Do you know that? The more your life is about you, the less your life, the less your life screams Jesus for others that are watching. So what does it look like to boil your life down? So verse seven, it says, so he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, listen to this, this is awesome. He, these, all these people are wanting to be baptized by John. They're thinking, like, this is awesome. Like, this guy's like the rock star Baptist, you know? Like, get out there and get baptized by this guy. And then he looks at him and he goes, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Like, why is it that you want to be baptized? And then he says in verse 8, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Like, there's something about the fruit that our lives bear that is actually rooted in our repentance, like our turning our lives over to Jesus and, and surrender to him actually allows our life to produce more fruit from him. And so it says, therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. And so what are they saying? They're saying, we have Abraham, we're in the lineage of Abraham, like we're in the bloodline of Abraham, we're all good. And John goes, your bloodline, your bloodline doesn't decide your salvation. And I think we live in a culture nowadays where some of us are taught that if we grew up in a Christian home, we're Christians. If I went to church with my family, like I'm a Christian, when I ask people, tell me your story, how did you come to know Jesus? When people say, um, well, I just always grew up in a Christian home, and um, you know, my parents were Christians, and I went to church, I'm like, 
the red flag starts going off in me, where it's like, at what point did Jesus become your own? Like, you can't ride on your parents' to- coattails forever. You can't ride on their salvation. I'm um, trying to look in Jesus in the eyes the day he comes back and say, well, my parents are Christian, so I'm good to go. No, it doesn't work. You have to give an account for your own life. And so John says, he calls him this brood of vipers. And this viper was seen to be this evil creature at the time. It was this, um, the, again, it's, its venom was deadly and it was devious. And so he's calling the religious at the time devious and deadly. And uh, Ma- Matthew Henry, the commentator, says uh, of this passage, by the fruits of repentance it will be known whether we are sincere or not. The change of our way must be evidenced by the change of our mind. If we be not really holy, both in heart and life, our profession of religion in relation to God and his church will stand us in no stead at all. John's basically calling them out for assuming that they're all good because of their father Abraham. And being that they're children of Abraham, like they shouldn't have to worry. They got this ticket. But again, your bloodline doesn't determine your salvation. Just because you grew up in a Christian home doesn't mean that you're a Christian. You have to come to the realization that you need Jesus for yourself, not just through your parents. There's two things that you're guaranteed to do in life. And you're only going to do one of those two. Either your life will lead people to Jesus or it will lead people away from him. That's it. Your life will do one of those two things. It'll lead people to Christ or it'll steer people away from him. The Bible talks a lot about being hot or cold and not lukewarm, that there's no such thing as the middle ground. There's no such thing as the gray area. You're either in or you're out. Either your life points people to Jesus or your life becomes um, like these brood of vipers that is actually devious and deadly and actually leads people down a path of destruction, whether you mean it to or not. If Jesus is not the sole source of sustenance in your life, that's what your life is doing. It's leading them astray. And so John's calling these guys out because you think you're Jews, because you grew up in the lineage of Abraham, because you, you think you have this inheritance and all is good, it's not like that. You still, we all are equal at the feet of the cross, right? <laughs> We all acknowledge at the feet of the cross that we are broken, wrecked individuals that desperately need Jesus, and without him, we don't have a leg to stand on, that he's the one who empowers us. It's because of his death and because of his resurrection, because of the empowerment that he's given us through his Holy Spirit, that we actually become these sons and these daughters of the Most High God. Without that, your life does not point people to Christ. And so your life will do one of these two things. John goes on to say, Uh, In verse 9, he says, Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. Pretty harsh. I mean, imagine the religious that are hearing this and going, like, seriously? Like, are you saying that we're not going to make it? And then he says, and the crowds were questioning him, saying, then what shall we do? Like, what's the answer? And John answers them and says, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. John's answer there is basically, you, through your repentance and your salvation, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you actually need to be compassionate, generous, and loving. And that only comes through Christ. So he's encouraging them, like, if you got two tunics, Like, give one to somebody who doesn't have one. Like, it's now time for you to think about others. If you are actually serious about this, then it's time that your life become ruled by Jesus and your life begins to bear fruit of compassion and love and grace uh, um, and generosity to others. And then he goes on and he says, and some tax collectors who also came to be baptized said to him, teacher, what do we do? So now the tax collectors are getting in it. Like, Well, how does it work for us? I mean, I know what you said to them. How does it work for us? And he says, collect no more than what you've been ordered to do. He basically says, don't be greedy and trust that God will be your provision. If that doesn't relate to us, I don't know what does. Then he goes on one more time and he says to them, um, or, and the soldiers now come to him and question him and they say, well, what about us? Like, what do we do? And he looks at the soldiers and he says, don't take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Like just because you can do something does not mean that you should. 
For us as believers, just because you can do something does not mean it's always God's best. And he looks at these soldiers and says, don't take money from anybody by force. Even though you can do that, don't do that. Don't accuse anyone falsely. Be content with what you have. Like he's stripping back things and he's developing this, like this simplicity, this solitude, like this very simple life that is only focused on Jesus. But what I love about John is that everything he does can only be driven by the Holy Spirit. I'm not telling you guys to leave this place and if you have two tunics, go give one away. I'm not telling you when you leave this place um, to just go like drain your bank account and do something good for somebody because that's what God's looking for is people that'll do good. What I'm saying is, if we trust that Jesus is the one who holds our whole life in his hands, do you trust him with every aspect of your life enough that you're gonna be led by his spirit to do things that the world won't understand, to say things that the world won't get, to live a life that the world will think is foolish. And God will actually use the foolish things of the world, like Paul says, to confound the wise. They won't get it. Goes on to say, verse 15, now while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts, about John as to whether he was the Christ. They're now thinking like, maybe this guy's the Messiah. John answers and said to them all, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's basically saying, like, it's Jesus when he comes that will be the judge. He's the one that knows the state of your heart. He's the one that gets to decide who the sheep and the goats are. He's the one who gets to decide who's the wheat and the chaff. Like, you know what your heart, the the state of your heart this morning, and no actions you do, no things you say actually dictate the trajectory of your life. It's how grounded you are in Jesus that actually dictates your trajectory. And only Jesus knows your heart this morning. So I can't stand up here and say like, you on this half of the room, you guys um, are the chaff. You know, I'm really sorry. You guys on this side of the room, like you guys are the wheat. Like you guys' hearts just look rotten. You guys look good. Like leave. Like what he's saying is I can't determine that. But there's one coming who can And he actually will. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. He will decide whose hearts were in, who was hot and who was cold. He finishes with this. Verse 18, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. What I love about John, his simplicity, his solitude. I love his willingness to be led by the Spirit, to say things that nobody else would say, to wear things... (laughs) I'm not telling you to go wear Christian t-shirts. Please don't um, misunderstand me this morning. But he wore things nobody else wore. He looked foolish. But what was God doing through John? He was preparing people for one that would come after him that mattered. John's life was nothing. And so there's three things that I want to leave you guys with this morning with regards to John's life and what I think God's calling our lives to look like. The first is this, that you become less. There's something about the gospel of Jesus that when we engage it, we realize that it's not about us and we become humbled and we become less and in becoming less, we actually become greater. And so John became less. Like you need to be a people who become less in your life. It's not about building more things, making more of yourself. It's not about doing more and saving more. It's about becoming less and realizing that Jesus is the focus. I mean, Jesus himself came wrapped in flesh and bones to this earth. He didn't have to do that, but he came in this lowly form. He came as the servant of mankind. He washed his disciples' feet. Like the man, uh, by, by anybody's view, would have been seen as just a servant or a slave. But in fact, he was the son of God. And so there's something about us that profess to follow Jesus that our lives are signified by us becoming less, by us being humbled enough that we become lower so that he becomes greater. Now, in becoming less, the second thing is that you become bold. Because what we see in John is that he was humbled and he became less. But in doing so, the man was this ferocious, like, 
force to be reckoned with for the gospel. He said what he needed to say. He did what he needed to do. He was just obedient to what God asked of him. He was steadfast. He kept going, and eventually the guy loses his head. He isn't even around for Jesus' death and resurrection. But he paves the way for the Lord, and he's bold in it. Become less. Become bold. And the last thing is become bright. Because I think in us becoming less, in us becoming bold, our lives begin to shine so much brighter for Jesus. It begins to be less of what you can do and say to lead others to Jesus, and more of just who you are that Christ would draw people to himself through you. Jesus talks about the city on a hill that cannot be hidden. He said, who lights a match and places a bowl over it? Like, no, it's meant to be put on display so that it lights up the darkness. Like, your life was meant to exude the light of Christ to the world. And this isn't something forceful. This is a privilege that we get to do as followers of Jesus, to exude the light of Christ, to be less so that he's more, to be bold, to make him known, and to let our light shine so others would be drawn to Christ through us when it had nothing to do with us at all. So I don't know where you guys are at this morning and what the state of your hearts are. I have a feeling that there's some of you in this room that maybe for the first time are hearing this, and they're like, I didn't understand that this is what the gospel was. I, uh, maybe what you've seen in the past is just hypocritical people that said one thing and did another, and you were sick of seeing that cycle, and you want to see truth. You want to know what truth is. It's right here. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. Nobody comes to God except through Jesus. So for some of you this morning, it's your first time maybe saying, like, I want to engage Jesus in a very real way. Because your life will lead people to Jesus or lead them away. But it's your choice as to which direction your life takes others. Some of you in this room, you've been Christians for a long time. And it's so easy to get into the same rut that the Pharisees and Sadducees got in. Where you just become like caught in this cycle, in this wheel of just going through the motions and doing Christian things and saying Christian things and like being a Christian without actually being rooted in Jesus. And so my hope is that for some of you, your hearts are starting to beat and you're feeling like it's time for me to re really engage Jesus in a real way. It's time for me to stop trying to act like a Christian and actually be like a mini Jesus, you know, like actually have the light of Christ in you, the Holy Spirit moving through you, actually be bright for him. And so I want to pray for us as we go on. And um, I just ask you guys before we pray to examine your heart. Like only you and God know the state of your heart this morning. But I guarantee you that his heart is for you. That he wants to draw you to himself. That he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And even though that sounds redundant and you've heard it before, it's truth. It's gospel truth that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Much like John the Baptist, that you would prepare the way for the second coming of Christ and make him known. Would you guys stand with me? Why don't you bow your heads and let's pray. Jesus, I want to just thank you for the honor and the privilege that we have in laying our lives down for the sake of Christ, in being less. God, some of us in this room have fought really hard to make ourselves more to gain notoriety, to, to build our lives, to make things happen on our own, to establish our own kingdoms and do a lot of really neat things. But in the end, God, if our hearts are distant from you, then all the things we put our hands to on this earth don't really matter. And so I pray, Jesus, that you would reprioritize our hearts. God, if some of them are off this morning, I pray that you just reveal yourself to some people in this room and show them, God, what it looks like to actually make less of themselves and their life and to elevate you. God, I'm praying this morning that we would be less, that we would be bold, and that we would shine brightly. And so I ask that your Holy Spirit would just come upon your church. God, I ask that as we leave these doors, God, that it wouldn't feel as though we need to forcefully make these things happen, 
But if we trust that it's your spirit within us that leads us and guides us, then Jesus, it's by your Holy Spirit that we are going to be humbled. It's by your Holy Spirit that we are going to be bold. And it's by your Holy Spirit that our lives are going to be bright without us having to do anything except for entrust our lives fully into your hands. God, I pray you'd encourage your church this morning. And I ask as we leave this place that um, because, Jesus, we are less bold and bright, it radically would shape our interactions with people. God, I pray for people in this room to be used in miraculous ways with their coworkers or with students they go to school with, God, or um, to be used in the gas station, at the grocery store, at home, in their families, that you would be so known and so evident in these people's lives that others would be curious as to what it is, who it is that they're following and how they can attain the same life that you've placed within your followers. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your church and all that you have done in it, all that you're doing in it, and all that you're going to do in it. And I pray, God, that not one person would leave this, leave this room this morning without acknowledging you as their Lord and Savior, believing that you died a horrible death for them on a cross in order to forgive them of their sins, but you didn't stay there, God. You rose again, and it's through the life of Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we actually find life now, that we're actually empowered as followers of Jesus to live this out. And so I pray, Lord, if there's those in this room that have never turned their hearts to you, never dedicated their lives to you as their personal savior, then I pray this morning they made that, they'd make that decision, God. They'd turn their hearts to yours and ask you to come and to save them this morning, God. And I pray as we leave here that not one person here would leave here without addressing their heart issues and dealing with the things that need to be dealt with so that they can be free to live for you and not have anything inhibiting them in any form or fashion. Lord, in your name we pray, amen.